All right, here we go. Welcome back to another episode of the Beginner's Guide to the 18th Century. I am Kendall, and today I am joined by Ginny Rose, who is the um, owner of GinnyLeFleur.com. I totally, I told you I was going to mess that up. I told you, <laughs> I, I, we need to go, I have to go back like 28 years to high school, French class. Madame Petit would be so disappointed in me. <laughs> yeah, Rose. Madame Davis does not want to know my French <laughs> level at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the show. I'm so glad to have you. So uh, for those who um, haven't haven't followed Jenny Rose's site, you're missing out. I don't know why you're not. But and if you do follow her, you know that she's a stylist. Um, and so you not only uh, do a whole bunch of 21st century weddings, hairstyle, makeup, but you are also uh, a big fan of doing 18th century hair and makeup, correct? Yes, it's my favorite. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I love my brides. <laughs> I love my brides. I love the modern, but I love being able to do historic hair. Like, it's so much fun. I, uh, you know, have, have for a long time followed you on social and checked out on Instagram all of your just fun adventures because <laughs> you are you know, always showcasing these gorgeous pictures in your beautiful gowns and awesome hair and all of your friends and your sisters too, right? You do everybody's hair up. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then of course your modern day looks that you give people. But I guess, you know, if you want to in usual fashion here on the Beginner's Guide to the 18th Century, give people a little background about how you got your start in the 18th century. I, so we, the, my first experience with like living history was when I was in the fourth grade, we'd started homeschooling and my mom, we were living in California and my mom was like, I don't know anything about California history. I don't know what to do. <laughs> and she found out there was this group in the original settlement. We were in San Diego. So this is old town, San Diego, where there was a group and you could dress up and do this thing called living history. And mom was like, well, if you live it, you'll remember it. So she signed us up and made us some Civil War era costumes, really bad ones. And, uh, <laughs> God love and the moms, then, though. God love the moms for, for, start, for doing in elementary yeah. school what we needed to get done. <laughs> you you got to start somewhere. And she was like, this is your California history. And that's what we did. So um, kind of fast forward to when we moved to Virginia. Um, I'm in Fredericksburg, Virginia now. And when we moved back this last time, um, I was in my 20s and I really wanted to get into living history and um, some kind of group again. I'd made costumes to that point, but like for Halloween and I would make things and then come up with a party so I could wear them and invite my friends from church because I didn't know anybody who did this thing. <laughs> uh, so they were on, you know, I knew online people, but they were like thousands of miles away. So I found a local group in um, Fredericksburg called the Rappahannock Colonial Heritage Society. Um, and they were a civilian dance based group, still are, they're still okay. around. Um, and I was like, I didn't want to do camp follower. <laughs> so I wanted civilian and there wasn't a civil war version. So I was like, cool, we'll do 18th century. I've never done that before. So I made my first 18th century dress and went to my first RCHS event. And that's how I got started. Man. Virginia, it's really easy to find 18th century events to go to here. And there's a really strong English country dance base like uh, right within right. Virginia there's I think there's and I don't even know anymore because I haven't been a part of that group now for many years but um there's at least six seven eight groups and they're all regional so there's like one based in Louisa the Williamsburg group the Alexandria group the Fredericksburg group and they have this kind of circuit of balls throughout the year they host one each year um, and then we would do community events as well and do dances and teach games to kids right. and that sort of yeah. thing. But as a, I was, you know, I was in my twenties, I was single. So like, I didn't have a guy to be attached to in a military unit. Right. So right. there wasn't a lot of options for me as a living history person. Mm -hmm. So I really, that's why I was specifically looking for a civilian. Cause I, I was by myself and I just needed a place where yeah. I could, could make fun things and, and, and experience the history. So as you are venturing into this world of living history in the 18th century, um, were you starting to do hair and makeup in, in like your professional life outside of that? No, I was okay. not. Um, I was trying to find a job that did not require me to work in an office nine to five mm -hmm. because I am a very independent creative sort of person. Um, so, same, same. Um, same. I was, 
I was doing, and I have done everything. I was, I babysat, I um, worked for my church, I edited radio spots, I did websites, um, yeah, and sewing on the side as well. Um, so I kind of did it all. And then I got to a point um, kind of after I had started well after a living history, I uh, kind of got to a point where I was like, okay, I need to figure out a way to make a living. Mm -hmm. and pay for this hobby of mine <laughs> in a way that's <laughs> what we fun. all are trying to figure out yes <laughs> right um and I I had gotten to a point with my like sewing commissions where I was like I either need to make this a proper business or I need to find something else mm -hmm. and when I sat down and looked at it the reality was that I hated it <laughs> I love sewing but I don't love sewing for other people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when I sewed for other people, it just took all of the joy out of it. Right. And I hated it. And I wanted sewing to be that place where I was happy um, and where I could be creative, my outlet rather than right. my living. Right. So I, I started like looking at other options and I don't know why it took me this long. Like I kind of considered hair and makeup in high school and again in my twenties and again, you know, and I, was like, why, why didn't I do this 15 years ago? But it, like all the stars aligned and everything fell into place and a school opened up. Uh, I actually ended up going to a Paul Mitchell school. Mm -hmm. um, Those are great schools too. They're great Those schools. They're really I, good schools. And there was nothing like that here before I was ready. Yeah, see, so, that's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, part of me is like, oh man, I wish I'd done it earlier. But the other part of me is like, things happen for a reason. Mm -hmm. And I had time to develop my history and to develop my costumer and my sewing skills. Right. Um, and then when I went into hair and makeup, it was really much easier to combine those. And also the, just the life experience, much easier to own my own business um, and um, be able to make that successful older. That, oh yeah, absolutely. No, I agree completely. I have a little, a little secret of mine is that when I was finishing high school, I was in that same boat where I didn't know what I was going to do. And I wanted to go into radio, but I didn't know how to get in radio. And I wasn't sure that I wanted to like go to school for, like, I didn't know. So for somehow I got some bogus idea that I was going to go be a nail tech and that's how it's going to work my way through college. So I went to cosmetology school, like just for nails and I failed. Like I just did, it was, oh. it was bad, but I, but then I got into radio right out of high school. So it was like, again, it all, it all and I met yeah. the woman who got me into radio because she came in to get her nails done at the school. Nice. You know, the discount, the discounted, you know? Uh, so anyway, <laughs> that's, yeah. Um, that's so cool. That's really interesting though, that it wasn't, that it wasn't a, a thing that you were doing first and then you thought, oh, I'll, I'll connect these. It's really cool that it did all come together. Yeah. So now, you know, you have a website, you have a YouTube channel, you have all of these, these options and outlets for people to learn about what you do, combining history and hair. And then do you, I know that you do weddings, um, but yeah. do you also do hair for people for events? Yes. For like um, 18th century events. Yeah, yeah. So balls are, um, we've got like in Alexandra, there's a big event every year called the Francaise Dinner. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm always busy that day. <laughs> I was going to say, how long does it take you to do someone's hair? Um, it depends on the style, but usually about an hour to an hour and a half or so. And it also depends on if I'm doing it period correct with pomade and powder or if I'm doing it with hairspray. Let's um, talk a little bit about that. <laughs> okay. Because that's a, that's, you know, that's a conversation that people have, especially this is the beginner's guide. So we're talking to people about what it's like to come into this community as a beginner. And I know, you know, some people are coming into this and they just want to do like Revlon and be camp followers. So hair isn't like this huge thing. But if you're coming into it and you are really on that costuming side and you want to do these exciting civilian experiences, you got to understand the whole hair and makeup situation. Yeah, yeah. It, it's if you're doing camp follower, it's really easy because you just put a cap on it. Right. Um, yeah, but totally. if you're gonna <laughs> if you're gonna go to an, a ball or an evening event, you know you, the hair shows. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's a. I know people struggle with it, like, oh, I'm not doing it right if I'm not doing it with the period, you know, products or techniques. Right. And I'm, I'm not in, I, I just don't have that opinion because I think that they're both valuable and they're both valid ways to do it. I think it's, um, I think if you really want to understand 18th century hair, you have to pomade and powder your hair, hair at least once. Right. Because it's the experience. Yeah. You have to have the experience mm -hmm. because then you understand what it's supposed to be and you can replicate that. 
So I'm, I love to learn about it. I love to experiment with it. I love to play with it, you know, the period correct ways. But uh, when I'm getting ready for an event, I'm, I'm not doing it. <laughs> right, right. Do you use a lot of um, the, the hair pieces and the different things to, in it when you're doing someone's hair? Y yes. Do you, um, do you make those things? I do. For people? I, okay. I do. Um, I have a shop on my website where I sell uh, hair pieces and aids and accessories. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason I started that was because I, so this is all artifice <laughs> and technique. My hair is naturally straight and limp. Um, so to get any curl or body in it is, you know, just what I do, right. but I don't actually have a lot of hair and I don't have enough hair to do historic styles. Most mm -hmm. historic styles require more hair than is on my head. Um, so I've always used, and I don't like wigs personally because, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, they can be uncomfortable, but more than that, they take up space. They take up space right. in the house and they take up right. space when I pack. Mm -hmm. And when you're going to events, I, um, for many years went to costume college and when you're flying across the country for a five day costume event, luggage space is at a premium <laughs> and I didn't want to fill it with wigs. So I've always used hair pieces. Mm -hmm. Um, and then that way also they're more versatile. So I can use them for every period. Right. You know, yeah. All you can use for everything. And, um, I, <laughs> I've started filming and editing for my YouTube channel, but I have a whole series of all the ways you can use hair falls because I use them in almost every hairstyle that I do in different ways. Um, so yeah, I I'm always using pieces and parts and for clients, it just depends on the style that they're looking for, how much hair they have. Mm -hmm. um, and again, whether it's, it's period, uh, correct ingredients and stuff. Um, but most of my clients don't want pomade and powder. Um, they're like me where they're, they just want it to be pretty. <laughs> right. Right. So, I tend to style for that, for those instances, like you can have the powder look without having to go through all of that effort. Um, cause pomade and powder is an investment in time. Mm -hmm, and if mm -hmm. you're not going to wear it for three to four days, at least it's not really worth your time in, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, so if you're going to go whole weekend in 18th century, yeah, pomade and powder and make your life easier. If you're going to one event, a ball, just use hairspray and powder on top of it. I, um, well, today I'm having a not good hair day. So it was a, <laughs> I ran out of time to wash it. So I grabbed my 16 year old daughter's dry shampoo and threw it up. And I, hey, I, dry I don't, shampoo is life. Dry dry shampoo, I like literally just, I, I had to learn from teenage daughters. I think my 12 year old has dry shampoo and I didn't know anything. <laughs> I was like, what is that dry shampoo stuff? Yeah. Not? If you, if you're not using dry shampoo, you're missing your life will change yeah. when you do. <laughs> yeah. So now I am, um, you know, I'm either, um, dressed for a living history site and typically I'm doing Regency if I'm with that anyway. And I've had like, that hasn't been one of my favorite eras, but suddenly because I watched Emma, now it is. Um, <laughs> and my friend is making me a new gown and I've been like really playing around with the hair and it is just, um, it's super fun. I really, I, oh, think I, love, I do. I love hair and makeup. So I've really been enjoying like that, that part of it because in 18th century, I'm almost always just doing camp follower. So, and I don't have, I had just started growing my hair back out. I used to be very like, I'm keeping my hair shorter. And then uh, now that I'm wanting to start doing more civilian events, I'm like, I'm, I'm growing that. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. <laughs> um, but it's not, you know, it's definitely not long enough. So I, I do all sorts, even with a cap, I just hate a flat cap hate a flat cap and I don't have enough hair to fill a cap out. So yeah. I've been, do, you know, I've been putting things in my hair, which is really kind of a pain when you're out camping for a weekend. Um, yeah. But, foundation, you know, and that's what they did as well. They were using pads and foundation pieces um, plus hair pieces. They were doing that as well. They didn't have the hair either. I, yeah. I've really started to get into it. So I'm excited that we're talking because I'm going to go just dive into your YouTube channel and everything and have you do all sorts of things for me. Cause I'm, and I, I think, you know, we're, we were talking earlier before we started recording. Um, I am planning if October yeah. happens, like October just may not happen period, yeah. but we, yeah. I will be, it'll be my first garden party experience, which is so exciting. So excited. This is my first big kind of <laughs> civilian thing and I'm getting a new gown made and yeah. So oh, that's um, such a great event to start with because it's so easy. You just buy the ticket and show up and it's yes. a truly beautiful, beautiful event. My sister and I've gone every year since it started and uh, it's like now one of our big highlights of the year because it's just, you just walk in and it's done. It's just done. It's just <laughs> beautiful. Yeah. All I have to do is get us dressed and we have to show up and then we just have a great time. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. 
Um, you mentioned about flying across the country and packing mm -hmm. for things. I've always wondered when, you know, people are going to Versailles and, and going to these, these events far away, how do you manage to pack <laughs> all of those gowns and accessories and things? I, I, you have to give me the inside scoop on that. There, there, it's an art and there's <laughs> usually at least one meltdown and, <laughs> Uh, uh, Dame Zola Mode, uh, Taylor, she did a really great video when she was packing for Venice. Um, and I like learned a couple of things from her, but it's interesting to see like how different we are. So my plan was the next time we did a big event, which God knows when that's going to be to do the same. Um, so one trick is to use packing cubes. Have mm -hmm. you seen those? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that helps a lot okay. because it keeps you organized. Oh, all um, right when you get there, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it keeps you organized in there too. So like for the garden party, I always pack cause I'm, I'm dressing for that event. I'm dressing myself, my sister and my mom. Mm -hmm. So I actually pack everyone's outfit in cubes, individual cubes. So I okay. don't need anything. So like stocking shoes, jewelry, hair, right. bottles, all of that. Oh, I do yeah. love organizing. Coffee. Yeah. <laughs> I do love it. That's um, exciting. But the other thing to keep in mind when you're going to, when you're going to, especially when you're flying, because that's the tricky part, because not only does it have to fit in the suitcase, but you have to have, you have a weight limit. Mm -hmm. So you have to be strategic about it. And I specifically plan out my outfits based on how I can pack them. Um, so for instance, I tend to, for costume college, I will stick to three, maybe four eras. So I'm only packing so many corsets and shoes. Right. Um, yeah. Whereas if you wear, you know, a bunch, so for instance, over five days, if I'm wearing, you know, four 18th century outfits, I'm using the same shoes and the same stays mm -hmm. and, and, you know, that kind of thing. So that helps with a lot with space. You know, if I'm going to bring one really big outfit, then the rest need to be fairly skinny. Silk taffeta is your friend because it compresses. <laughs> <laughs> what do you, <laughs> do, what do, you do about wrinkles when you're traveling? What do you do about when you're, when you're clothing, especially like, I guess if you have linen and silk and... <laughs> You, you factor in a couple of hours or a half. I usually like for costume college, I fly in a day early and I run errands for half the day, and, like grab snacks at Whole Foods and the rest of that day is spent ironing. Okay. Because I, there's no way to not have wrinkles right, in my right. experience. Yeah. Um, so I like to like get to the event. If I can get there early, get all the ironing out of the way and then mm -hmm. I can just party the rest of the way right. as opposed to like, ironing every night for the next morning that gets real old yeah that yeah because i've seen people joy, like yeah. in you know in france like on instagram with like steam i'm like where did you bring the steam machine with you where are, these are these are details i always need to know <laughs> i do have friends that bring steamers and you can buy them they're little like oh my, that kind little of little okay. travel size it's like this big it's yeah. really cute and like i like it when i travel with her because i can use it but for most things i usually just just iron. It's yeah. fine. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sure this is probably people watching probably aren't really that interested in my need to know this information, but thank you for sharing. With me. <laughs> it's like two years of unsolved mysteries. You just gave me the like, how do you travel? Last, how about this? Last thing, some advice for people who are just getting into the community. You know, one of the things I'm still fairly new in the community myself, and that's why I wanted to start the beginner's guide from a beginner perspective, because it was so challenging coming in, especially not being in a community where there are people nearby that can give you, you know, this, this sort of like guidance on your, on your new journey. It can feel overwhelming at first because you're just like, I don't even know what a shift means. What does that mean? And why is that not a corset? And, you know, just, it's like those little things that I think the longer you're in, you take for granted. Um, yeah. And just the fact that like, why should my hair, um, be pulled up under a cap and not a modern, you know, modern color or modern whatever sticking out. Why does that matter? So just those kind of like basic things I'm always trying to think of somebody who's brand new coming into this um, and maybe going back to your early days of doing this. Do you have any advice for people just starting out? Yeah. Um, I think for, well, for both hair and for sewing, you just have to do it. I mean, you can, do research as well, get advice from people. There's lots of great resources online, including yours now. Um, but sewing, my mom always said that sewing was 20% uh, knowledge and 80% experience. Mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. will only get so far without actually doing it. And yeah. you learn along the way. 
and you grow along the way. And hair is the same thing. Get a couple of good techniques under your belt and then just start doing it and practice and get better at it. Um, you know, for hair, it's hard because there just aren't as many resources out there. There's now more resources for 18th century hair than any other hair period because American Duchess wrote a book. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. But that's like it. Yeah. So yeah. like if you want to go beyond the 18th century, it's harder. Um, so if you're in the 18th century and you started on that, you're very lucky because mm -hmm. you actually have resources. Um, and yeah, I think my biggest advice is get online, get on Pinterest, and just start looking at images. Start looking at the portraiture, start looking at the, even the caricature so you know what the extremes are. Mm -hmm. um, just start looking at images and, and start building in your brain a library of what it's supposed to look like. And at some point your skills will be there and you'll put on an outfit and you look in the mirror and you will look like those images that you had in your head that you've mm -hmm. researched. And that's when the aha moment goes and that's when you are completely hooked. You'll get addicted before, but you'll be like hooked for life at that moment when you finally produce what's in your head mm -hmm. and what you've been looking mm -hmm. at. But I think for me, the, the thing that's been the most valuable, both as a seamstress and as a hairstylist, is just looking at images. And the more you look at and the, the wider breadth you have of, um, you know, it, time period and you know specific styles and areas like you know Europe and America the more you look at the more knowledge you have in your head and the more you can interpret that um oh we didn't talk about one thing you are working on virtual classes we have to talk about yes. this before we go yes so I have been working behind the scenes since like all this started developing some online classes and I'll be announcing those dates uh starting this month in May so Ooh. Yay. I'm very excited because I, I love teaching and I love sharing my knowledge and it was such an eye-opener to go to cosmetology school and actually learn this stuff properly and learn the science behind it and why yeah. things work and why things don't work um, and just I, I've always struggled with my hair and so especially for costume events and so to be able to pass that on and you know not have you struggle and have a meltdown before the gala like that's my goal. <laughs> I'm so excited. Sign me up. I'm there. I can't wait. I love, I love <laughs> hair. I love makeup. So I'm, I'm pretty pumped about this. Have a good one. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me.